Well, welcome everybody to this Sunday worship. Um, uh, well, we are in Little Baddo, of course, but you'll see we're in a very different environment. It was a lovely idea. It got colder and colder, as you were always uh, you were aware of um, in the last few weeks. And uh, Graham thought it would be rather nice, and I think it's rather nice that we are actually at St Andrews this today um, and enjoying St Andrews. And then we had a great debate Graham and I just now as to why it's called St Andrews. I think I was told by Brian but I can't remember. So that's the first thing you can race to your um, emails or whatever and, or phones and tell me why it's called St Andrews. I can see that there's a nice little um, uh, hanging on the wall of St Andrew I guess. But anyway so there you go. Um, welcome this Sunday to um, St Andrews for our Sunday worship. Of course we're we're worshipping on you perhaps and not one or two of you will remember realize that it's also St Valentine's Day um, this Sunday um, so and I should think one or two of you and maybe couples of you or possibly not um, that means that's quite a significant day and I want to hold on to St Valentine because the Church of England and in fact the rest of the church is a bit snooty about St Valentine they don't sort of they don't really want to go into St Valentine they can't work out who St Valentine was and whether there were several of them and all that sort of thing but I think it makes a lot of difference because the Valentine that I've come across years ago was someone that was um, martyred um, in the third century um, and one, one of my legendary stories I think said that he actually put himself forward as the person that would um, die instead of another person. But there again, I may be thinking about all sorts of different other stories of different other people in different other ages. But um, I think we need to celebrate Valentine. And one of the things I'm going to do to do that is um, it's a little, tiny little poem that um, I've, I've come across about three times in the last three weeks. So it's, it's probably just um, a collection of poems has just been published by um, Brian Bilston. It's, it's his publication, his collection, is called um, A Collection of Poems, uh, Alexa, What is There to Know About Love? And uh, this is called um, Serenity Prayer. Send me a slow news day, a quiet, subdued day, in which nothing much happens of note, just the passing of time, the consumption of wine, and a rerun of murder, she wrote. Grant me a no news day, a spare me your views day, in which nothing much happens at all. A few hours together, some regional weather, a day we can barely recall. I think it's a lovely poem for these days where we're, we're a bit worked up and uh, we need to have be calmed down and uh, sense that it's linked up to Valentine's Day I think I like that a few hours together <laughs> and some regional weather we've certainly had that in the last week or so and that's something that I'd like to bring into this um, this time together 
as well. Graham reminds me that the snow came on Monday. Um, I'm someone who hates ice and terrified of sliding around all over the place, but snow, and uh, much snow, can be beautiful for a, for a while. And it's especially better to be um, uh, active, I think, when it's cold weather. And I certainly was active on Monday um, when uh, I walked with the dog very early in the morning in Lingwood Common and it was just tremendous, um, the, the, the sound of snow, um, the crunchiness of the snow, not the thin stuff but the sort of when things just keep um, coming um, and it was absolutely beautiful. And there's something about snow, I don't know what it is, perhaps because we can't do an awful lot apart from acknowledge it. Um, uh, it, it creates an atmosphere uh, if you are secure enough to be able to enjoy it and able and warm enough to be able to be out in it, uh, which you can't do really for very much a, a long time. But um, it does kind of slow things down a bit um, when you can embrace it. Uh, and I wrote something um, along those lines when I was thinking a, a year or so back about a particular experience. For me, snow is a bit like um, meditation, really. Um, or at least, it, it, again, it's trying to still yourself, uh, which is why we had to be still for the presence of the Lord is here in this place. The, the nature of snow, uh, as well as the nature of just being able to um, calm yourself down, stop thinking about yourself, the issues around, um, and focus. I think snow does that as well as landscape does it. Um, and it's, it's it, what happens when you do that and you're relaxed enough and you have the time to give, just not thinking things through but allowing things to come to you. So this is what I wrote a while back. It's called I Thou and it's part of a collection about winter. Snow falls, and everything is different. The landscape is transformed, accentuating the little that has escaped to covering, as if in high definition. This is a world of sharp focus, as concentrated as real praying. High up, the tiniest bird, a firecrest, hops its way around the branch of a pine. All busy and focused, worrying at the calyx of a fir cone. It looks like play. There is a jauntiness about the bobbing little creature. But the game is survival, and no creature stops too long. 
all is on the move, purposefully foraging or making tracks home. There are few contemplatives in this world of snow and ice, except the ones who have been overcome, ready to drop, like the temperature. The light, thin and watery, stretches across the landscape of white, collecting at a tussock of shivered grass, playing upon the suspended ice drops. Tracks are pristine in the snow. The signs beyond doubt of the many comings and goings outside our knowledge. As snow falls, so does silence. It is a special gift of snow, though the questions remain circling like wild beasts. There is nothing to fear. A meeting beckons when there is a willingness to embrace life beyond my control. The landscape is in whiteout. The ferociousness of self-possession is disarmed by beauty. With heightened awareness, the breathing slows and quietens, attending to the silence. And a little firecrest picks its way to paradise, aware of nothing but the eternal moment. I read that because it... It was prompted by the snow, but of course what I was exploring there was an experience for me of trying to be aware of a presence that is, that is around that I can't control, um, that is not um, frightening, but is overwhelmingly real, um, for me anyway. Um, and it was a fire crest, or possibly a gold crest, that I was watching when that first came into my mind, when there was snow actually around a, a few years ago. But it's this eternal moment that I think anyone can capture if they still themselves and they're not worried or anxious and they're able to open up to things beyond our own control. Having said that, the walk in Lingwood Common was wonderful because I was actually the first person that morning to have walked. I can obviously tell that because no other tracks, apart from lots of tracks of foxes and badgers and bits of birds and things like that. And it was just, it was just a wonderful, beautiful gift at the beginning of the day, um, which is going to be in my memory for a few weeks now, especially this time of ice, which isn't so good. spend a little bit of time opening our minds and our hearts to the light. Recalling moments of vision and clear sight. Reflected glory and stunning transformations. And the beauty of wild things, living life to the full. Holy Spirit, direct our gaze and focus our attention on all that shares our common space and give us cause to wonder. as you plant the seeds of love within us all. Give us grace to respond tenderly to love and light within the fabric of the universe, which feeds all life.
This particular Sunday, of, of course, is a Sunday just before the beginning of Lent. Uh, it'll be next Wednesday, it's Ash Wednesday. And you'll notice um, something that sort of gives a little clue to all this. First of all, obviously, the, the Gospel reading. Um, I think I'm right in saying that in, in our modern lectionaries, the Sunday before Lent is always a particular story of Jesus um, from either Matthew, Mark or Luke. Um, I, I will come to that in a minute. Uh, but, uh, this, but you'll no, notice, um, and it's really, all right, I'll just say what it is. It, it's focusing on the transfiguration, a story that's quite extraordinary in these three Gospels, uh, which isn't in John's Gospel. Uh, but it's the images of, um, of light um, that you get, of a sense of uh, mystery, which I hope the, the, the little bird poem picks up. It's kind of, except it's very normal, and I, I like to say it is very normal and very um, homespun that these things can happen to anyone, um, regardless of whether they've been years in the church, nothing to do with faith at all, or just like these days that we've had in this pandemic, just attending more to nature and a sense of um, slowing down. So these are the opportunities to actually experience something really quite extraordinary. Um, that's how I see, anyway, the God that is within the midst of us. Psalm 50 is the set um, psalm for this Sunday. I'm only going to use um, the six verses um, of course, the psalms are like poems from the um, scriptures from the Old Testament, um, very traditional views. But you'll notice um, it brings in um, a, a greater world um, and, and the time as well, and this extraordinary sense of God beyond us. So I'm just going to read quite slowly, as I tend to do, um, the first six verses of Psalm 50. The Lord, the most mighty God, has spoken and called the world from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not keep silence. Consuming fire goes out before him and a mighty tempest stirs about him. He calls the heaven above and the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful who have sealed my covenant with sacrifice. Let the heavens declare his righteousness. For God himself is judge. And the special prayer for this morning, the Sunday next before Lent. Almighty Father, whose Son was revealed in majesty before he suffered death upon the cross, give us grace to perceive his glory, that we may be strengthened to suffer with him and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Our Gospel reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, beginning at the second verse. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart from themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his garments became glistening, intensely white, as no fuller on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking to Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is well that we are here. Let us make three booths, tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were exceedingly afraid. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. It's an extraordinary piece of writing. Remember that Mark's gospel is the first written gospel. It's the first experience of of, uh, this passage. It comes in Mark's gospel, if you read Mark's gospel, I'm trying to encourage you all to read Mark's gospel and only read and not read other gospels, just Mark and what that does to you. It's an extraordinary um, experience really and it doesn't take all that long because it's a very short gospel. But this is the turning point, or just the, the, the chapter before in chapter 8, the turning point. There seems to be two parts to Mark's gospel. The first is Jesus' ministry and his teaching. Remember, Jesus just appears on the scene as John the Baptist does. There's no birth narrative. There's no sort of trying to think about what Jesus was like as a little child or whatever. Um, Straight away, as an adult in the wilderness, um, John the Baptist um, encounters him. Um, And funnily enough, well, I don't know, I think it's... I think he's a very sophisticated writer, actually, Mark. But um, at that moment, of course, Jesus asks for baptism. And blow me down, what do we hear? But um, the voice, actually, is not addressed to anyone else. I think it's just to Jesus himself when he's being baptised. This is my beloved son, or uh, you are my beloved son. Um, And here, in this transfiguration story, um, listen to him. Um, the the three disciples are told. Um, So there is a link, really. Um, At the beginning of the Gospel, uh, linking Psalm 2 um, as well, um, a very important thing for Jesus himself to feel that he is part of God's story. He is bringing God's um, salvation to all um, through his life. And that's at the very beginning. And halfway through Mark's Gospel, we get the same strange sort of mysterious experience again. But it's a very different sort of place. We've got three disciples now. No, uh, in the baptism that appeared in Mark's Gospel anyway, no one, no one around to sort of comment on it, apart from John the Baptist. But here, um, the disciples are chosen by Jesus to go up a high mountain, um, and of course, um, mountains are associated with uh, God's presence, and uh, there are so many links with um, experiences of mystery and God's revelation. With um, going back in Scripture with Moses and Elijah, um, and if you if you look um, if you look at Mark's gospel, uh, at chapter eight, just at the end of um, chapter 8, just before we get to this extraordinary um, story. You'll, you'll hear, um, you'll see that uh, Mark writes uh, something about um, uh, all sorts of things. That there, there is the, the sense in which, in chapter 8, at the, towards the end, 
is Peter saying um, when when Jesus starts asking what do people think who he is and eventually Peter says you are the Christ um, and, uh, and, and, and Jesus says I don't want you to say anything to anyone and then he begins to tell him about the suffering that the Son of Man has to go, has to endure and Peter stops him and says this can't happen to you and there's all, as I say, all hell's to let loose, perhaps that's not the right expression, but Jesus is extremely angry and tells him, it's what well, just said, get behind me, Satan. Mm. Um, and, and, and so it's a massive, this is, a, this is Mark saying something is being, he's trying to express something about Jesus. This is the first gospel to be written down. This is after the decades of the preaching of St. Paul talking about, the Christ, what Paul is doing. If you only had St. Paul's letters and no other gospel, um, you would get a sense of, of, of what God is doing through Christ. But you wouldn't actually be able to see Christ. There's no sense of the person of Jesus. And what I think Mark is doing is filling in the human face of God in Jesus. And so the link with Paul's theology is coming here. So uh, what, what the disciples, halfway through this gospel, they never really get it particularly, and especially it's so pronounced at this point when Peter is saying, you are the Christ. So he's trying to say, yes, I know who you are, but he doesn't know how, to, how Jesus has to get there or how God has to get there through suffering. And that was never been acknowledged by any of the disciples. They can't get it. Um, And if you read the gospel, just Mark's gospel, you will discover this. Then Mark is not trying to belittle disciples. He's saying the important thing to realise is the only way God's salvation can be broken open is through suffering. And that is what Jesus has to go through. And so right just at the point where we have this terrible trajectory of going right down into the depths of suffering that Jesus has himself to go through. We have this extraordinary transfiguring experience. This is how Mark is is presenting it. And we see, it's almost like a film, isn't it? How it could be, how it will be in the end, you know, glory. And um, Jesus is transfigured in this story, transfiguration. Um, uh, um, His garments become glistening. Um, th- th- so many, so many experiences of this sense of uh, light uh, associated with God's presence, um, and also it links up with um, a, a really interesting detail at the very beginning of that gospel reading. I read, and after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John. After six days, well, I don't know why. After six days, it's absolutely no. Well, actually, if you link up to the book of Exodus. And you go back to the story of Moses. And when Moses is told by God to meet him on the mountain and he takes a couple, three people with him to meet him on the mountain. Um, and it's after six days, um, God's, God appears to Moses. Extraordinary links. But these are the strong links that Mark, who knows his scriptures, is making. Here is, here is someone who is fulfilling um, the, the, the divine action of God and who, who, whose saving power is for all people and all creatures. And it's, it's linked up with this, this really rather crude image of the Mappa Mountain. Um, and, and this wonderful thing, and Peter is completely floored by it. And I just love the sort of ordinariness of saying, well, it's good that we're here, you know, and then being very frightened. It's all very human, really. It's extraordinary. You get the combination of extraordinary sort of uh, an event that's outside our capacity to understand or or believe really and yet also ordinariness as well um and uh, you know let's make three booths or three tabernacles um you could say uh doesn't quite know what to do it sounds like making a snowman almost you know it's that sort of thing um and then this cloud overshadowing them and then this and then the voice again for the disciples this is my beloved son listen to him 
Uh, it's just wonderful. And of course, after that gospel reading, they plunge themselves down into the bottom and the, again, uh, immediately confronted by um, some child, young man, overtaken, possessed by a spirit. And it's, it's that kind of height of experience and then down into the depths and you suddenly realise the suffering that is being endured, that that's the sort of thing that Jesus is having to confront all the time. Um, it's an amazing piece of writing, and no wonder it's being picked up by Luke and Matthew as well, and they put all sorts of other detail in it. But I think the fact that it's in Mark's Gospel, the first Gospel to be written, and that there is a plan and a, a purpose about his trajectory, his, his Gospel, and, and that now... We are coming into Jerusalem and more and more conflict. And it is through suffering that God reveals himself. And at the end, as we know, um, we believe um, with the resurrection that the spirit will raise Jesus from the dead. Uh, it, it's just, it, you know, it's just a wonderful thing. I mean, apart from that, we've got the, 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 the great... Um, the, the, the first verse of chapter 9, just before that, and I, which I think is possibly a commentary on this extraordinary experience, uh, and, and which comes from the other Gospels, I think possibly from a different source. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. And I just feel that that is Mark's view, that this is, this is a kind of an intimation of if all coming together through... A God being in Christ, which is, of course, St. Paul's big preaching um, uh, mission to, to allow people to see that through this humble man, this extraordinary person, um, through the suffering that he has to endure, which is God in Christ um, reconciling all things to him. It's a wonderful piece, and it's a wonderful that it comes just before Ash Wednesday, when we're all tipped into a sense of, gosh, things are very different in, in our lives and we need to be mindful of God's great um, purpose of love in our life that can actually endure um, and through, through suffering but through love um, we will find a way to life. Um, I hope that gives something for you to think about on this wonderful Day, this uh, St. Valentine's Day, where sacrificial love is um, celebrated in Christ. On St. Valentine's Day, where saint and martyr, legend and story, merge and muddle a history long forgotten, we give thanks for all who, to this day, willingly let go of their lives for the sake of others, bringing light and movement, healing and strength beyond themselves. And for those who are romantic and those who are not, for those who have loved and those who have lost love, but remember the beauty and the engagement and the journey deeper into love. We give thanks for those whom we love, whom we have loved. Giving thanks for spe simple special memories, intimacies and the strength that love can bring. We give thanks for all examples of people, men and women, who in their own time have given themselves and helped us see love in fresh versions within our human frame. We give thanks for those whom we continue to love and for those who are married or committed in deep ways, so we ask for grace.
to continue that journey deeper into love and life, binding us together. We remember places in the world, both near and far, coping with much fear and darkness at this time. Those fighting disease and who are tired and spent. Those trying to dismantle the evils crouching behind poverty, with integrity and the pursuit of justice. The young and the brave standing in the way of persecution and the old who support them and fear for young lives. We remember particularly the upheaval in Myanmar and remember our obligations to the school in Umpium and individuals and friendships born of many years. We remember those who defend and shield the vulnerable, the carers of the world, whose sacrifices keep others safe. As we remember individuals and situations in our prayer, we place them in light. In our community, here in Little Baddo and elsewhere, those who are joining with us. We remember those who are sick, the frightened, all who carry heavy burdens of responsibility, and those grappling with stark choices where there is little light to guide. We think of those who are grieving and those whose loved ones have died within this last year of pandemic. As we place them all in our mind's eye, we wish to give those around hope and laughter, care and fellow feeling. Difficult when we cannot see or touch each other on the arm to reassure. Instead, we place them in light. Put our prayers where your love beckons. Transfiguration reveals an eternal moment through blinding vision. For some it is sheer beauty, for others it is a gift of understanding, and for all we are seen in the brightest light. After the stunning silent snow line of the morning, Tuesday brought with it children's chortling as they tobogganed on Griffin's Field and in other places, hooting, hollering and laughter. In these wintry days, living Lord, transfigure our present experience with the light of your love deep within and ignite our community once again. Merciful Father, Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.